Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Table Talk Podcast, a companion uh, piece to our weekly cooking show, Cooking with Debbie and Friends, that uh, is filmed right here in our kitchen every Sunday at noon. My name is Travis, and it's my pleasure to introduce my lover, my wife, <laughs> the host of the show, <laughs> Debbie Gutierrez. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad that you made it, and we've been getting some of your questions already. So thank you for coming on. Thank you for getting questions ready for our guests. As usual, we have a little recap of what we did. Mm -hmm. So Sunday we made, um, oh, we made soup and sandwiches. We made- That soup was so good. Yeah, we made a roasted red pepper soup. With ricotta cheese. With ricotta cheese. And then we made a grown up, and chipotle, your favorite. Mm -hmm. And then we made a grown up grilled cheese. And you guys were submitting these grilled cheese. Remember Debbie Gross said, she got one in Hawaii that had like 16,000 different kinds of cheeses. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sounded good though, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love cheese. I know you do. Oh my gosh. Well, and um, and that what, what we did was Gouda with uh, Granny Smith slices real thin, which was really good on sourdough. The sourdough bread makes it really good too. What I would do differently, like I said on the show, is maybe soften that in some butter real quick. He's a texture some, guy. Yeah. You know. But it was very tasty. So if you didn't get to see that episode, maybe check it out on our YouTube channel or Facebook again because it is a really good recipe you want to do. Yeah. Especially if it's getting cold where you're at. Yeah. And um, we're going to say hi to everybody who's joined us. Thank you. Mm. You guys are so cute the way you go quiet when the guest starts talking. I know. Yeah. <laughs> but then all the questions, I go, any questions? And they all come up. So first of all, everybody likes my top. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. It's very pretty. <laughs> I didn't notice it. Well, you wear black all the time. Yeah. Black is your new gym. Sure. And when I wear black, people say we look like beatniks. Yeah, so. I don't mind that, though. Beatniks. My dad. Hello, my dad. You're the number one. Hello, family. Rhea and Pilar. Rhea and Pilar and Richard. And Richard. Her son in love. Um, Debbie Wheatley Ferguson. Hello, Debbie. So glad to have you here. Eva, Debbie Grow. Debbie, we've got a fellow Lancer on. Suzanne Denlinger, all the way from uh, Texas, who went to Vegas and is watching us in Vegas. Um, my sister, Monica Casares, who um, I just got to see yesterday. We had a social distance walk and it was Finalmente, really huh? nice. It was so nice. Yeah. And BG uh, from down the street. BG, you're going to love this episode. You're going to, BG is one of the most um, consciously aware person of what she's eating, what she's mm -hmm. bringing into her home. But she's she really going to live always in. is eating something delicious. Yeah. Well, good food yeah, doesn't have to You don't have, have to, to compromise be... yeah, no, taste anymore. No. Hi, Eva. Thank you. Um, love the chic blouse. Hi, Joe Casas. Hi, all the way from Windy Azusa Canyon. I know. Hi, Flora and Cindy Castillo. Hey, Cindy. What's up, familia? Hola. Debbie Grow, class of 78 in the house. Woohoo! Debbie, we got so many shares. I put that um, that our guest was going to be on, mm -hmm. and we got so many shares. I think 16 shares. Okay. So um, that's pretty good. Yeah. So anyway. Um, so my dad said that there's a little bit of an echo. I'm not sure. Is anyone else hearing that? Loretta is here. And Loretta, Yvonne. guess who we have on? You know her well. And Yvonne Hernandez. It is starting to turn into a high school reunion thing. That's pretty good. It is. So tell yeah. us about, um, well, first, before we bring the, the guest on, we've got coming up this Sunday, something delicious, something right? Something delicious, okay. always. And next table talk is going to be Kristen Key. Kristen Key. Oh, my God. She's so funny. Kristen Hilarious. Key. Yeah, she is very, very funny. You're going to like her. It's going to be nothing but whimsy and fun and music. And so we try to stagger these podcasts. So sometimes you're learning something and sometimes you're just having a good time. Um, yay, I'm on class of 83. And Monica did say, yeah, kind of an echo. Hmm. I wonder. Michael Baca's here. He just said no echo. So let's try that. Did okay. it change things? I don't know. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to, we're going to keep this moving. Deb, why don't you go ahead and introduce our guest for the evening? I have known our guest since we were 14 years old. And we went to school together and we were active in student government together. And we just, she would come to my house for big like work parties and I would go to her mom and dad's house. It was so lovely. And she studied hard and she was a good girl. 
and she went off to college and she became an amazing doctor and I tell dirty jokes in Las Vegas. <laughs> That's how that turned out. Yeah. But I am so happy she agreed to not only come on our show, but she had a fountain, a wealth of information that she wanted to talk about. So um, without um, further ado, I'd like to tell you about my friend, Teresa Rohr, who is now Teresa Rohr Kirk Graber, and she's an adolescent medicine physician, a contributor to local and national radio television promoting healthy lifestyles, and the executive director of the National Center of Excellence in women's health at Indiana University. She is making a move in the country to take on some other amazing and important things. Mm -hmm. So please welcome my friend, Teresa Rohr Kirkgraber. Please say your last name. Kurt Graber. But you know, it's, a, it's okay. I only use the Kurt Graber half when my husband's around. So, you know, okay. the roar is a whole lot easier, just four letters. <laughs> you look fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You look like you did in high school. Oh, well, you know, that's when the camera helps out a little bit, I think. You know, I think you just have <laughs> really good kids and a really good life. And Well, that's true. Aww. That's true. You Aww. know? So, it, 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 how, go ahead. How many years have you been married? Um, 30. 30 years? Yeah. yeah. Oh, my gosh. It's, and it's been good. You know, you, you have to choose wisely. And uh, it's, it's definitely a commitment. When we got married, I told my husband, Paul, that um, he had a 67 year contract. And that <laughs> after 67 years, if you want to leave, go right ahead. You know, it'd probably be so old and shriveled like nobody would want it anyway. But <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to be one of those 25 years, you know, getting the little trophy wife. I said, I am the trophy wife. So there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's, and it's, you have children and, and people are saying we've got Yvonne Hernandez, Martin Villanueva, Debbie Grow. These are all people that you know. Yeah. And what I think is lovely is they're all talking to each other right now. And <laughs> uh, one of our neighbors is just lovingly referring to you as Dr. T. That's good enough. <laughs> That's good enough. And you have children and grandchildren. We have three kids, boy, girl, boy. Two of them live in Atlanta and uh, one lives in New York City. And we have two granddaughters here in Atlanta. So that's why I'm kind of moving. I'm moving south. So I'm going to be starting a new position with the Medical College of Georgia at the UGA campus in Athens um, starting in March. So I can be a little bit closer to to them and, and my two granddaughters. I get to babysit uh, this whole month of January. I'm just babysitting and being with oh, it. How exciting. Nice. Oh, that it's sounds fabulous. great. Now, when I contacted you, actually, Loretta, Loretta Roar, people that watch the show, you guys know Loretta, right? Where I'm always like, come on, Loretta, you can do this, Loretta. And then she sends me pictures and we put them up. Your mom's picture has been on our show a couple of times because Loretta has made a wonderful dish. And um, she said, my sister Teresa would love to be on your show. So when I contacted you, and we're going to get into some uh, medical issues and stuff, but when I first contacted you, you said, you would love to talk about good food and you could talk all day about Absolutely. good food. So that's your passion. Absolutely. Well, especially as a physician. So I do internal medicine in adolescence. So basically I start at 12 and go up from there. And I think it has been so obvious how, I'm not, I don't want to say bad food. I wanted to say how badly we can treat our bodies by the things that we put in it. And that can have such an impact on how we move, how we think, how we, you know, all of that. And at the same time, you know, for the last 10 years or so, I've been working with patients who have eating disorders. And I think from that, from that experience, I've learned so much about not going on diets and not restricting us, you know? So it's not about this good food or bad food. It's about what is going to make your body work and how is it going to make it work? So we have to think about all the different food groups and, and why each of those things has something to, to use and, and, and something that can be good for us. But we can't get hung up on, oh, my God, I shouldn't have had that. You know, no, if you're going to have it, then have it, enjoy it and think about it the whole time and savor it. But if you are constantly berating yourself about what you did and how you did it, it just it's a it's a nasty cycle that just kind of gets started. Mm -hmm. 
So you don't separate the emotional from the actual physical of eating. It all works together. Well, it should. I mean, you know, I think what you don't want is to sit down, watch television, and all of a sudden that bag of chips is gone. You're like, what the heck? Yeah. You know? that That's kind of emotional eating or or mindless eating. Mm -hmm. If you're going to, if if you really want those chips, you know, one, have a smaller bag, but two, enjoy them, mm -hmm. savor it. Because if you're really eating it for the taste and the flavor, you should have the opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. if, if you're, you know, if you're sitting down and, you know, pretty soon that, you know, whole gallon is gone and you're like, what happened? That's, that's mindless. But you also have to kind of think, you know, when you are eating something, is it, are you hungry or are you bored? I mean, think how many times I would go to my mother's house to visit. I would go immediately to the refrigerator. Don't tell do that. No, me too. Yeah. Well, and don't I do it. I yeah. still do it, you know? And, and I would fool myself going, well, it's just because she buys things that I don't. But that's not it. It's it's clearly an emotional thing going Absolutely. to your mother's refrigerator or cupboard. Absolutely. And so, you know, when you go to grab something, you have to think, you know, am I, am I hungry or am I bored? And yeah. if I'm really needing, if I'm really hungry, then fine. But if I'm doing it just because I'm bored or I'm sad or I'm depressed or I'm lonely or whatever, there are a lot of other things that you can do besides food. Oh, well, we would love to hear about that because in the age of COVID, everybody's eating. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, but everyone's cooking too. And I think they're, yeah. they're more often than before, I think. People are taking risks uh, in the kitchen with new things they're experimenting. But I want to go back to a little bit when you started talking about more of the types of foods that we should be eating. How do you respond to the availability of foods that are better for us, for, for people that might not be able to afford it? And with that, I'll just interject that Debbie does a really good job about saying, I got this from this store for this price. And so you do have some options, but how do you address that in the people that you speak with? So there are definitely areas where there are food deserts and, and we're, we're working to try to get rid of those. In fact, we've had a couple of programs where the medical students would actually go to the farmer's market on Saturday, bring the food back to a housing project and then set up a, you know, a, a farmer's market there in the housing project or things like that. Or one of our, our federally qualified health centers actually started to grow a garden. And so the patients actually come and, and pick up food and stuff. So we have a food pantry right at the clinic. So those kinds of things are really useful. So it's true that there are food deserts, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be totally restricted. Um, so, so let's talk a little bit about price. Certainly, you know, everybody says fruits and vegetables are good for you. Okay, well, they are. All right. They're expensive. Can be. They can be. But frozen. Frozen is so, I mean, it's really, not only is it usually cheaper than fresh, but it's actually fresher than fresh. Because if you think about it, they're in the farm, they pick it off, they put it through the thing, it goes into the freezer, boom. When you are taking fresh to the market, you pick it, you clean it, you have to put it on the truck and then you have to carry it to the place and then it has to get stacked in, you know, so it can be a couple of days old by the time it gets there and all that time it's being kind of degraded a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I tell folks frozen, not a problem, easy to do. And, and it makes life so much, you know, quicker and faster. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, Deb talks about that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, or dried. I love dried dried yeah. living in Los Angeles, you know, and having all that great, oh my God, those dates from India and the dried apricots and stuff. And they're they're more expensive to purchase, but they don't go bad. No, you so, know, and you can buy them in bulk. You yeah. And one of my most precious memories was one of my sons, um, I came home one day and because yeah, we didn't keep too much junk food around and he's at the computer eating dried cranberries. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> Those are so good though. And they last just a little handful and they taste so good in your mouth it's and they fabulous. feel good. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it is, we don't have to spend a lot of money on, you know, the fresh raspberries and the fresh blueberries or whatever. There are plenty of ways of being able to get things that you know, even if you have to travel a little bit of a distance to, to get them. Yes, it's definitely harder if your only mode of food is the grocery, is the uh, gas station, granted. 
but there's things that you can kind of look and choose and, and think maybe soups instead or like a vegetable soup rather than picking the hot dog off the container, you know, off that little roller thing. You know, so there are definitely ways that you can do it, but you do have to be, I think, conscientious, you know, sure. and, and it doesn't have to be crazy. I mean, I think I love I love the USDA choosemyplate.gov. I think that was the best thing. They they really kind of nailed it with not saying, you know, all these different levels and stuff. It's like, here's your little thing, you know, look at your plate. Here's a here's a plate. Half mm -hmm. of it's fruit and vegetable, another's a little piece of protein, another's a complex carb, and there's a glass of milk. Okay. So every time you sit down, you go, Where's my vegetable? You know, do mm -hmm. I put it where I have that's a different color on the plate here? Mm -hmm. You know. Um, and so it makes it relatively easy then to think about so many ounces of this and that and the right. other. Right. Oh, now, you said choose my plate dot gov. Right. Okay. Can you reach our questions? I ran I, sure to, I ran to the um to the computer so fast because you came on before the show and I was I wanted to catch up with you and I accidentally <laughs> left my questions. Oh, now do you you uh, include all food groups? Are you a proponent of vegetarian or plant-based eating? So yes and no. Okay. And I and I I like that I, answer. <laughs> well by that I mean I I I think having dealt with eating disorder patients for so long I recognize that there is a certain amount of angst that comes with trying to choose always the right food. If you, I think a plant-based diet can be fabulous and there's a lot of great reasons for it. I mean, if you think about it, a plant-based based diet really helps not only what you're putting in, but it also can be very, very helpful for the environment in terms of, you know, decreased pesticides and fertilizers and methane gas and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think a plant-based diet can be really fabulous. However, <laughs> I have had vegetarians who don't eat vegetables. So I have to be cautious um, you do because that? you you know you can have potato chips and a coke and that can be lunch. That's true. Yeah, French fries, okay. Oreos. Okay. Right. Right. So so I I think what, when we ask you know are you vegetarian and they're like oh well let me let me really find out what you're eating though and yeah. the other thing is is plant based you can certainly get in enough protein but you do have to know how to choose so you have to recognize what's protein and making sure that you're getting it enough because it's just a little bit harder right my, my oldest son was vegetarian for most of his adolescence and you know he was playing soccer and hockey and running cross country and everything else and you know we had to work to make sure that he was getting in enough protein um, and but it, it's doable you know it's it's putting gar garbanzo beans on things it's making sure there's extra peanut butter as a snack it's you know, that kind of stuff or egg protein, um, if he was at least going to be doing that, you know. So so my worry is usually, especially with my younger patients who go on a plant-based diet, is that they don't have the nutritional background and they end up just cutting out whole swaths of things, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so that, that's, that's, what, that's why I say yes and no. I think in many ways it's fabulous, but you really have to kind of know what you're doing. Okay. Do you do you have a limit on the types of protein that you should be taking in every week? Like, I mean. Okay. She looked you, at me. <laughs> you she, can eat a steak every night. Yeah, I could. I love red meat and I love cheese. Now, I I made the mistake of telling Debbie what my doctor said about my numbers. And I'll tell you this, I've been better and we've been better about incorporating other types of meats in there. But um, is there a good way to approach incorporating other types of things for, for people that might not have the options that I do in that I, I live with an amazing cook? Yeah, yeah. Well, certainly, I mean, think, think about things that are protein that are relatively easy. You know, things like any, any, uh, any of the nut butters are fabulous. Um, a little high in fat, but it's a good fat. Um, eggs, eggs are a fabulous source of protein and dirt cheap, dirt yeah. cheap, yeah. you know? That's a, that is a great way of getting some in. The cheeses are, are good. I love the cheeses for the dairy. I'm a little bit conscientious though about the 
the fat content, you know, because if you think about it, cheese is basically milk that's had all the water sucked out. Um, and so that's why it's a higher caloric content, but it's also a usually higher fat content. But if you love cheese, think about part skim mozzarella because they make mozzarella from, you know, from, from low fat milk. And so you can actually have, you know, that string cheese can be fabulous and you don't have that, that too. Yeah. That, yeah, yeah. So there, I think with everything, there's a way of kind of finagling it a little bit, but also kind of thinking about why is it that you love red meat? Is it because, you know, do you have a little bit of an iron deficiency? And if that's the case, maybe you need to be thinking about some of those foods that have high iron, like beets. Oh, they're fabulous. And have you ever tried the dried beets? Oh, they're like, no. oh, like chips. Oh, yeah, you just eat them like you're eating a potato well, chip. I'm diabetic, type 2. Uh -huh. And we talked about that years ago. You sent me a, like, a three-page letter. It was so thoughtful. And <laughs> I was just so amazed at your concern and compassion. Um, and so some of the dried things I can't partake, like the dried fruit, and I have to be real careful with that kind mm -hmm. of of stuff. So the fresh, the fresh do me great. So mm -hmm. that yeah. does work for me. We have a question. Sure. Um, there's a lot of controversy about drinking milk, knowing that many adults are lactose intolerant have lactose intolerance, I would love to know your thoughts about drinking milk. So so let's talk for a second about lactose intolerance. And that's exactly what it is. It's not an allergy. It's the fact that you have an enzyme in the lining of your gut called lactase. And lactase is what's there to break down the sugar in milk. And the sugar in milk is lactose. Now, sometimes you have plenty of lactase. So, you know, you had two pieces of pizza tonight, nothing happened. And then you put cream in your coffee tomorrow and you're like, oof, blowing out the... The potty. It can happen the next day. Oh yeah. Well, it's because you have a certain amount, and if you use up everything one day, you may not have enough left over for the next day. And that's why some people will go, "No, I can't be lactose intolerant because I just had pizza and it didn't yeah. bother me. Why did coffee today bother me?" And and they're trying to figure it out. So the first thing I do is I ha I tell people to do the milk test. And the milk test is basically three glasses of milk. It doesn't matter whether it's skim or whole. Three glasses of milk, boom, boom, boom. If you are not on the pot pooping your brains out within the next hour, you are not lactose intolerant. Because it's it's like you you you, you overwhelmed your system and you used it all up. If you, you do not have that. pardon? You depleted all the lactase. Yeah, right. So now your body really is tested. It's tested, right? Okay. But if you if you if you are able to make enough lactase, you can drink your three glasses of milk, and nothing's going to happen to you. You're mm. going to be. And even people who are lactose intolerant can usually tolerate a cup of milk a day. So that's why some days you're not you're fine, and then the next day mm, you're not. But you but you asked specifically about milk, so so I wanted to kind of separate those two things because if you are lactose intolerant, there's plenty of other options. You know, one like I say, a cup of milk a day is usually still tolerated. Two, there's lactate tablets, and the lactate tablets are basically the lactase, that enzyme, in a pill. But you can't just take one. If you're going to have a bowl of ice cream, you might need a handful of lactate tablets because it's basically those lactate tablets are digesting that lactose that's in the milk or in the ice cream. So don't just take one and think, oh, it didn't work. No, no, no. I mean, it depends on how much you're getting in. So there's certainly other ways of, of getting in that calcium and stuff. Probably most of the controversy about milk has to do with the bovine proteins. There are a handful of folks who are really allergic to bovine proteins. Okay, there, there really are. There are some. For everybody else, the concern is for all the hormones that are in the milk. Okay. Well, there are a little bit of hormones in the milk. It's true, um, and sometimes antibiotics and things like that can get into the getting get into the feed and get into the milk. So my bias is, if that's really your concern, then go for the organic and the free range and the you know made without hormones and all that other kind of stuff. Milk. There are so many good things, honestly, about milk. I mean, the calcium, the magnesium, the phosphorus, the vitamin D. That I mean, the list just kind of goes on and on. But if somebody is really doesn't want to do it, then fine. Okay. I'm not going to twist their arm. I know that you can get your calcium in other ways, but you know, it takes four cups of spinach to equal the amount of calcium in one glass of milk. Oh my God, really? Wow. So, well, so let me ask you though, 
because there there's almond milk there's all oh, milk there's all yeah. these all these other milks are you going to get the same nutritional value out of those other milks that's that you a good would question. the regular so, whole or stem so i'm glad you asked that because no you you, you don't um in fact things like calcium for example um, the only milk that has calcium that's natural is almond milk because there's a little bit of calcium in almonds but it's still it's not the same as the amount that's in cow's milk um, it's added as a powder so calcium and vitamin d are added to most of those milks as a powder and so when it says on the top of the label shake well they really mean that because mm. if you don't shake it that powder is sticking to the sides of the carton and not getting into your glass so you think you're getting it and you're really not. If you have an ideological reason to not drink cow's milk and you drink one of the others, fine. I mean, you just, like I say, have to be kind of conscientious about, you may not be getting all the calcium that you need. You may not be getting all the magnesium that you need. There are other proteins that are in there that you're not getting. Okay, find another way of, of putting it in. Okay. Go ahead. I have a question on that. I do want to invite our audience. They're so cute. They're like, I forgot to say hi because I'm so interested in the con and the content. And Tom, um, good to see you. And Tom Salazar. Um, people that are listening, feel free to ask um, Dr. Teresa questions and we will read them here if she hasn't already covered them. Um, do you believe in supplements, vitamin supplements? And if so, how much do we need to take? Oh, look at that yeah, face. That, that was an <laughs> response. Wow. So. Response. You know, so here's the thing. There, I think there's there's great evidence to suggest if you are a woman who's menstruating, whether or not you're planning on having kids or not, you should be on a multiple vitamin every day. Okay, but that's that is mostly because that you need to have enough folic acid in your body when you first become pregnant, in order to avoid cleft palate and spina bifida within the first month. So when a woman gets pregnant. Those two defects, spina bifida and cleft palate, can happen in that first month if you are folate deficient. And folate is a, is a water-soluble vitamin that you get mostly in fruits and veggies. So if you are menstruating, you should be taking a multiple vitamin once a day or at least you know, five or six times a week just to make sure that you have enough folic acid in your body just in case. Now, granted, if you're planning on getting pregnant, absolutely, you're probably taking your prenatals and you're being really careful, but it's that person who wasn't quite planning on it and oops, you know? Um, so so that, that, that's a no brainer, okay? Mm -hmm. The other supplements, here's, here's the bias. The only time people really get into trouble nutritionally is when they overdo it on the supplements. So, you know, if you are really deficient in something, it can be useful. So granted, I have a number of patients that will have a, a vitamin D deficiency. Um, normal vitamin D, depending on the lab, is somewhere between 30 and 100. So somebody has a vitamin D of nine um, and, you know, I, we got to get the vitamin D in them. So yes, I'll do a 50,000 units once a week or so to kind of get their, their levels back up. But the times when you really see people have difficulties is when they are just overdoing it on the supplements. Um, and let me give you one example. Oh, yes, yeah, it's fabulous. So we did, we wrote a couple of articles on this. So biotin. How many women out there are using biotin for your hair and your nails? Yada, yada, mm -hmm. yada. Stop it. Okay. Here's a reason. Pilar, did you hear that? <laughs> it doesn't affect you. They put it in her Christmas stocking. Oh, oh my gosh. It's well, hair, it they're, called, it they're called hair, nail, and skin vitamins, right? Right, right. Okay. So, so biotin, it, it, it's not that the biotin is bad, okay? And inside your body, it doesn't do anything bad. But if you are still having chest pain and you're going to the emergency room, the blood test that's done is something called a troponin. It's a muscle enzyme that gets broken down when there's a heart attack. Biotin interferes with the machine's capability of measuring that level of troponin. And so women already are, I don't have chest pain in the same men do. We get kind of pooped like, oh yeah, it's all anxiety and you know, whatever. So we go thinking, oh my goodness, I wonder if I'm having a heart attack. They draw blood, the blood test comes back, the troponin level is low because the biotin has interfered with its ability to be read on the machine. So instead of the, the doctor being able to go, oh, your troponin level is elevated, you're having a heart attack. It's like, 
yeah, you get your pondon level spine. It's not a heart attack. I don't know what it is, but go on home. And so then you're sitting at home and you're like, oh, I'm having that pain again. And you're, and you're like, well, no, he said it wasn't a heart attack. And then boom, you're dead. So it, okay. it could so, cause a false negative. On a right. Attack. So it causes a false negative on troponin, but it also interferes with thyroid measurements. And thyroid is a very common disorder in, in women, low thyroid, um, or overactive or underactive thyroid. And so when you're trying to, to get the medicine just right, the biotin again interferes with the machine to, to get it just the right way. So you can get a false, a false reading on your thyroid levels. So that's the reason it's not that biotin itself is bad. It's just that it could, and you don't know which lab has which machine. And so you just don't want to take the chance. If you really want to get your hair and nails good, Jello. Oh. Fabulous protein. Mm -hmm. Jello, I mean, it gives you some good yeah, stuff. Jello. Yeah. Yeah. Really? It has a mm -hmm. gelatin in it. What would it do to my beautiful hair? You can't see this, but I have a really long, <laughs> very long hair. It's we have a we have a question from the um from the audience, Tom Salazar. Um, oh, that's a good question. Yeah. It, I'm picking it because it's a it's something that you complain about and people that I know. Yeah. Is there anything that they can eat or put into their diet for, that would uh, help with cramps in the legs at night? Oh. And let me tell you, know, you as a Mexican woman, what I've heard. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Because some of those wives' tales, um, pickle juice, to drink pickle juice. And I've also heard put a bar of soap in your bed. Oh, and you know under what, your sheets. And I do something else, too. And I, I drink a lot of Gatorade because... I feel like um, I get a lot of cramps, and when I drink Gatorade, I don't get those cramps. I did ask my doctor, and I told him how much I was drinking. He said it's not too much, but I've heard that also creates other issues. But I'm really doing it because, like Debbie said, every single night, my legs, I get really restless and cramps. And obviously, Tom does, Tom too. Tom mentioning it as well, yeah. So how about that? Is there... So, you know, you, 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 mentioned about, yeah, you mentioned a couple things, you know, you mentioned about how you much you love red meat and that you also get this kind of restless leg thing at night. Both of those can be signs of iron deficiency. So oh. I, I'm sure if you had your blood tested, it, maybe they did a CBC. If not, yeah. they probably should have. And then, you know, you might even see what your ferritin level was. So, so that numbers were, were okay. Yeah. The only, really the only number that was kind of not even really high, but close to the bottom was the cholesterol. Hmm. That's why she keeps trying to get rid of my cheese. Stop it. Yeah. So what can, so is there anything we so, can recommend for Tom? So, so there's a couple things. One is leg cramps can be from a number of different reasons. So, you know, don't, don't let me, you know, be, take the place of you actually seeing your position. Absolutely. Because, yeah. because you know, when you have cramps, it can partly be because there's not enough blood getting down into your legs. So first we think about what are the blood vessels like kind of going down there in the first place. So secondly, trying to keep then your legs warm. So I have a, a number of patients who will actually sleep, sleep in the mummy sleeping bags. Okay. Now think about this. What the hell if is a mummy sleeping bag? You know, it's when you go camping and they have those really skinny ones, they're, they're nylon and you can kind of just get in them and they, mm. you know, you can't, because the idea is that, your feet, your body will try to keep your core warm, you know, when it's cold, it kind of, it, it'll take it away from your fingers and your toes and everything else and just keep it where your, where your heart and your gut and everything needs to be. So as it pulls, it pulls blood kind of away from your extremities, that makes the muscles kind of tense up a little bit and constrict, and that can give a lot of the cramp stuff. If you're sleeping in a mummy sleeping bag, your foot doesn't get that cold spot in the, in the bed at night. You know, it, it helps to kind of keep all the warmth really close to you. So that so that's one of the things is like, you know, how is the blood really flowing down there? The other thing is what you're talking about with the Gatorade has probably a lot to do with electrolytes. My bias, quite honestly, is I'm not a huge Gatorade fan. I'm a big water fan. And I'm also, you know, what about bananas and coconuts? And, you know, because of the things that we probably get away from is the potassium, the magnesium, the zinc, that kind of stuff. And you get those a lot with fresh fruits and vegetables, but you also get it a lot with, you know, um, using water to help kind of flush out those things that you don't need. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that can cause cramps, which is kind of interesting, is caffeine. Um, we yeah. find that- we are caffeine, are you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Okay. Well, when you have that cramp, I want you to think. Oh, hmm. So, so no, no, you don't have to. You don't have to take it all the way away. You have to, so this show I mean, is. We we build this show as as foods that will keep you healthy, but now we're learning some of them are not keeping us so happy. Remember, everything in moderation. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So so if you if you need your cup or two of coffee in the morning, feel free, you know. But remember, caffeine is a diuretic, yeah. so it's pulling things out of your body. Mm -hmm. So you're if you're using a lot of caffeine, you're pulling out some of those really good things, and you're mm -hmm. peeing them out. And so then later on, you're you're fatigued and tired. Well, why? Because it's also a bit of a diuretic, and so you are. Yeah. Yeah. You know, at two o'clock in the afternoon, instead of reaching for your Diet Coke, you should be thinking, well, how much water have I had? Because mm -hmm. those two cups of coffee peed out four glasses of water. So have I replaced it yet or not? You know, okay. my so other many, bias is, is caffeine, nothing afternoon. So that includes iced tea, coffee, yeah. et cetera. Well, think about this, though. For some folks, now not everybody, okay, but, but caffeine can last in your system for like 10 hours. So if you are reaching for the caffeinated beverage and you think you need to go to sleep, you know, within 10 hours of it, Don't, maybe yeah. not such a great idea. Now, there are people who are fast caffeine metabolizers. And that's why, you know, my husband goes, oh, I can drink a cup of coffee and go to bed. Well, he doesn't because I don't let him. But, but. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, do you, do you slip him the decaf? <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny because we were out to dinner not too long ago and, and he, you know, had a Diet Coke or something like that. And and the next morning after he got up and I, because I didn't say anything, I didn't even notice he was doing it. And and he got the next morning, gets up and goes, see, I went to sleep just fine. Well, it's true. He's a fast caffeine metabolizer and we have that from that 23 Me thing. So we know it. So yes, there are people that they can tolerate. But even still, remember that it's it's depleting your body of some of the electrolytes it's pulling out some of the fluids. It's irritating the lining of your stomach. So you have more reflux and stuff like that. It's taking the calcium out of your bones. So you have more osteoporosis later on in life. I mean, wow. Take what you, you know, moderation is key. Okay. Oh, so Jack is asking, is green tea better than coffee? Jack, Jack DeBellis. Grandpa I Jack. I think Jack's in Philadelphia or Pennsylvania somewhere. Yeah, my I think. daughter moved yeah. out there too, and she has a question as well. She asked, "Okay, so we'll do Jack's too." And then hers was about the gelatin, the oh, Jello. Yeah. Is it an internal or external thing? Are there tablets oh, you internal. can take? Internal. So oh, you're don't eating spend money. Don't spend money on tablets and all that stuff. You know, okay, just the regular the Jello, like just make some lime Jello. And yeah, yeah. Or you know, the best thing is I like that Knox unflavored gelatin. Because then you can put it into stuff and it's not so sweet and gunky, you know, um, or you can mix it, the Nox unflavored gelatin, you can mix with, you know, your own fruit juice instead of cold water. And that makes it taste a little bit better and it's not so sugary and stuff. That's a great idea. Yeah. Um, so Jack so, DeVillis wanted to know tea. green tea better than coffee. And Tom Salazar says, should I go decaf? So green tea versus black tea, basically green tea and black tea are almost the same thing. It's just that green tea comes off of the, the plant earlier in the process than black tea does. So they both have caffeine in them. So, so the way green tea is made to be like, oh, it's so much better is because it's younger. So there's more, um, there are more good things in it. There's more mm -hmm. antioxidants mm -hmm. and stuff like that in a green leaf rather than a dead, you know, think about, think about the leaf in springtime versus the leaf in the fall. They both have a lot of the similarities, but the one in the springtime, the little deers will eat that, but they won't eat those little dried leaves because they're not as tasty. So it's the same kind of thing. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that when you're drinking green tea, it's like really, really, really good. If you had a salad, you'd probably, you'd probably get a thousand times more of the good stuff than you would by drinking the green tea. But that's, so, that's so that I know, because people were asking about Diet Coke, and now we're hearing yeah. green tea. Uh, Tanya asked, tea. how bad is Diet Coke? And, that's and, my coffee in them. And then you've got decaf. So all in all, it's moderation. It's not afternoon. Make sure you're drinking a lot of water in the afternoon, especially. But but these things, they're not. Uh, what, what's your take on, on having them in a healthy diet? I mean, it's yeah, still I mean, okay. Absolutely. It, it's okay. You know, everything, like I say, everything in moderation. So, so, you know, if you want, if, if you're having your Diet Coke in the morning and that's your coffee and you're just having one, hey, no worries. You know, make sure that you're getting some good fluids in later. Make sure that you're, that you're getting in the, the, um, 
the milk and everything else that you need later on in the day. But you know, don't don't worry about it. Like if you want your cup of coffee in the morning, have your cup of coffee, but heck, have it with some milk, not that artificial creamer. I was just going to ask coffee. you about artificial but, creamer and sugars. I recently yeah. switched to something called monk fruit sweetener. Yeah. I don't know if it's still a bunch I'm of, um, yeah, we're trying to get and away from the, from the chemicals. So if yeah. what's, the, what's the best way to dress a cup of coffee, if you like it, um, sweet and creamy. So I have to tell you my bias. My bias is that um, I try to use real milk. Um, and what I use is evaporated skim milk. So um, because I think if you use if you, uh, evaporated skim milk, doesn't mm -hmm. have any sugar in it or anything like that, but it's really heavy. So it's the consistency of cream. It tastes great, but you don't have any of that hydrogenated stuff and it's yeah, all yeah, non fat. Yeah. And so you're getting the calcium and the vitamin D that you need. Um, and so that works out fabulous in terms of the sweetener, you know, my bias is just to try to get away from it little by little by little. Um, if you like a little honey or you like a little sweetener in it, I mean, that's fine. But I also have had people who will put like five sweet and lows into their one cup. Now, okay. Over at the end of the day, don't you have about that many? No, well, don't packets? point at me like that in front of my own <laughs> friend. No, it's no, I, I, I use a large Yeti cooler and in the morning I get 20 ounces of coffee and I put two Splendas in there. And then if I have a cup of tea at night, which I do every night, I put one Splenda in there. And now so I'm going to hear that's too much. No, yeah, that, that's not, that's not too much. I mean, I, I have had some folks with neurological problems because they were really, I mean, one woman had 200 little pink things of, you know, what? every day. Yeah. And so you got mm. some little wacky stuff. Um, but I, I'm sending my husband a note because my computer is like going low. So I'm <laughs> trying to tell him, bring me a plug. <laughs> oh, no. Have him say hi when he comes I think, through. I we're, oh yeah. I, I, hopefully, hopefully I'm still okay. I thought I was fine, but so, so all of the artificial sweeteners, let me tell you a little story about artificial sweeteners. Okay. This is going to kind of gross you out, but the very gross first. Gross us out. Okay. I wanted to be grossed out. The very first artificial sweetener was, um, made back in the 1950s or so and it was yeah well um no it was even before aspartamine so mm. yeah so i can't remember the exact name now but so here's the story so the guys in there it's because it was always men at that time you know working not working in the science lab and they're smoking because you could smoke back in the day right so in he's the lab. In and yeah right in the lab and he's working on coal tar he's working on coal tar do, 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 puts the cigarette down picks it back up and goes, huh, that was kind of sweet. I wonder what that was. And that's how the first artificial sweetener um, was made. But it it's a derivative of coal tar. Coal tar, like coal. Like coal. Ground, yeah. Yeah. Tar. Yeah. 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 So, so, I mean, I don't get me wrong. I, I think the artificial sweeteners can be really helpful, especially with when you have diabetes and, you know, you have to stay away from sugars. The hassle is that you get, it's almost like your body kind of goes, did I have sugar or not? You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, mm. and we know for a fact, it doesn't make you skinnier because people think, well, if I have my diet Coke, I can eat my French fries and cheeseburger. No, no, no. You know? So if you, if you need a little bit of sweetness, my bias is to try to use something else that's more natural. Like for example, you know, if I'm having a tea, I love to put dried fruit in there, you know? In your because, tea? Well, yeah. I mean, think oh, about how pretty would herbal. that be? Think about all those herbal tea things, you know, they're peach and yada yada. Well, that's what it is. It's, you know, or you put a piece of orange in your, in your water with hot water. Oh my gosh, that can be really, it tastes great. And you're not yeah. adding anything, you know, and the amount of sugar or anything in those is incredibly small. Yeah. Philo is saying he puts honey in his coffee. coffee. That I, sounds yeah. good too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you um, get a little good stuff in the, the honey. Remember, you can't use honey if, you're, uh, if your kids are under the age of one year old. Right. Hmm. Right. Um, Ron Cardenas just joined us to Debbie and says hello to Debbie Grow. So I'm telling you, Marie LaBeouf, it's like a Lancer reunion here. Um, BG Casas has a question. Is um, And it was one of my questions, too. Um, Intermittent it's about, fasting. It's about fasting. Yeah. Because, you know, we were raised with the three square meals. 
And then when I took my classes at Kaiser, when I first became diabetic, it was six small meals. And now I'm seeing things about fasting. So um, she says, you know, fasting can help with weight loss, fight inflammation helps low. Is there any evidence that it can help with weight loss, fight, fight inflammation, lower insulin levels, and so much more? So, so yes and no. So, so here's the thing. Um, it's not that you have to have three big meals, six small meals. At the end of the day, you have to get in the calories that your body needs to work properly. And it's better to have them kind of stoked all day long rather than in one fell swoop, you know? So you don't want to do 1500 calories at night before you go to bed and eat nothing for the rest of the day, because all of that energy that you didn't need is getting put into, you know, into storage. So it, I think it is better to kind of leave things kind of moving. Now, intermittent fasting can work with some folks because it helps to make them be more mindful of when they're eating. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can think I'm not going to eat until noon or whatever. Fine. The hassle, though, and this is why it's a yes or no. The hassle is that some people kind of use it as a binge purge sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I saw a number of eating disorder patients who, no, 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 I can't eat, I can't eat, I can't eat. Oh my God, it's time to eat and and put it all in because it's okay as long as I'm only eating between twelve and six. Mm -hmm. And so it would start up this cycle of deny yourself, deny yourself, deny yourself. Oh my God, hurry up, get in and fit. You know, it's kind of, so, so it, it really depends on the person. And it, it also depends on that when you do break your fast, that you are putting in good things that your body can still use mm -hmm. you know, the rest of the day. I mean, in, in theory, we do fast. I mean, if you eat dinner at six or seven and you don't eat again until you get up in the morning. That's a good 12 hours or so. Mm -hmm. I think it, it, I think intermittent fast can be helpful for those patients or those people who, who need to be very mindful and say, I need this, you know, or, or I don't, or it, it just that you have to be a little bit cautious with taking it to an extreme, right? you know, and, and it, then if then, Oh my God, it's, it's kind of like with fat Tuesday, you know, oh my God, you know, everybody else eat all everything because mm -hmm. I'm not gonna be able to have it for the next 40 days or so. Um, and that then just kind of sets up a bad cycle. So it, it works for some folks. Okay, like I say, just be really conscientious about you know what you're doing during the time that you're able to eat and making sure that you're getting in good things. Mm -hmm. So what what's an example of one of your favorite meals? And what's an example of one of your favorite guilty pleasures? Oh, goodness. I think a good guilty pleasure is a glass of Guinness. Oh, oh my yeah. gosh. You are so You're as tall as a glass of Guinness. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. That sounds but, I mean, it's, it's like it's a meal, you know. It's so thick and kind of creamy. Um, I cook well, my with dad, it. My dad used to make beer. And so he, he did? Would, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And he would, he would brew it at home. But when we were little kids, we couldn't drink the beer, but we, he would give us the yeast on the bottom. Oh. And so we thought we were really kind of cool being able to drink a little bit of dad's homemade beer, you know, but really it was this horrible yeasty stuff, but that really kind of got me the good flavor for that dark, deep beer. <laughs> oh, this is so good, but that's your guilty. That's your guilty. Oh um, yeah. That's my guilty. So I think probably one of the things that I like the most is there's these really great fish tacos that a recipe that I got from Eating Well. Eating Well and Cooking Light are like my Bibles. Um, they are they are not about diets or anything else. They're just about healthy eating. They've been around for years and years and years. They're magazines. Um, and when you get them, you just kind of briefly go through stuff. And it, it does talk about some new things like, you know, why is kale good and stuff like that. But it's just the... Um, it's just that it gives good, healthy meals overall. And this fish taco recipe is not, is not, oh yeah, did you find my cord? Oh, this one. I think it's upstairs that you went to go find it. <laughs> get your steps in. That's what I always tell myself. Go. I'm getting my steps in. That's right. <laughs> um, but anyways, and, and so it's, it's, it's grilled, not fried fish. Um, and the tacos are soft tacos. Soft tacos, another mean for you don't have to fry the fry the tortillas. Mm -hmm. And you know, red red uh, cabbage um, with just a little bit of kind of like an olive oil and garlic. Oh man, good. Wonderful. That was from eating well. And what was the other one you said? Cooking light. 
cooking mm -hmm. light. You, you mentioned um, when you opened that part about that, you said it's not a diet book and it's not about diets, but I think a lot of people, myself included, I'll just speak for myself. I find that even though I don't eat really poorly, I don't eat a lot of junk. My favorite snack is popcorn with a good popcorn salt. I don't eat it every like night. Like in the pot, like not one yeah. of those. Yeah, because I know microwave popcorn has yeah. a ton of yeah, stuff. Yeah, I don't in. eat that. But I don't. Yeah. Tell your husband to say hi. Oh, you have to say hi, love. Hi, love. <laughs> your wife is so incredibly <laughs> smart. <laughs> and she talked yeah. about how incredibly smart you are too. Uh oh, that's scary. <laughs> 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 only good things. She's only saying good things about you. Thanks. <laughs> so um, what I was saying about diet is um, I am moving more since December. I started roller skating on my lunch hour a couple, a few times a week, okay. which is really good. But I can't seem to break like I'm I hover between 230 and 250. I know when you look at me, I don't look like I'm carrying it that way, but I'm I'm heavy like that. But what would you say for someone that's really struggling with diets? How do they get started and how do they keep it so that it's not a fad? Right. Because fads ruin any progress because it just doesn't work, right? Yeah, keto came back. Big keto comes back every five years called something mm -hmm. different, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so first, I first what I start out with, and I do this with all of my patients, is try to take a food diary for two weeks, and I mean, write down everything, everything. You know, before you put it in your mouth, take a picture of it. Um, get an idea of how much it weighs. I mean, you can put in seven hundred calories a day just by snacking. Um, you know, not not even thinking about what you're doing. What are you mm -hmm. going to have? The other thing is, what are you drinking? I mean. Let me give you an example. I had a young girl who came in and she's like, oh, Dr. Roy, I got to get off of this depot. It's making me fat. And she came in with her two liter bottle of soda. Oh my God. Now, granted, depot can can put on pounds. It's a it's a long acting reversible contraceptive. It lasts for three months. It's a shot. But it, it can cause a little bit of weight gain. But I said, honey, how many of those you drink in a day? Two. Oh, my gosh. Four two oh my two gosh. liter bottles of red soda. Oh, at three day, she was putting in, and and she had no idea how many calories that was. That was two thousand calories a day. How do people not know that? You know, they're just not thinking. I mean, so so I would look at the Gatorade. I mean, because if you think about it, it's, I mean, you want the electrolytes and stuff. Good for you, but you know, then how about how about getting the bananas, you know, and and the cranberries and those kinds of things in rather than. Rather than the Gatorade, but I'm not I'm not distant Gatorade. Don't get don't get me wrong. Yeah, yeah. But the first thing I would do is is really look at um you know look take a really good food diary. The second um, is two weeks, how two weeks. how are you sleeping? If that was our, that was the next well. question we had. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I yeah. mean if if you're not sleeping well, you don't get that restorative sleep. Your basic metabolic rate the next day is going to be lowered. It's just you know, just move slower. So that's so that's another really important thing. Then the last is kind of thinking about insulin resistance. We know that it's almost like a fat cell gets in the way of the insulin receptor. So your body is trying to get the insulin's around and it's it's like a barge. It's carrying the sugar and it's trying to get the sugar into the cell and the insulin receptor is on the lining of the cell and it's like a door, you know? Mm -hmm. And so the insulin's coming up and like, go and let me in. And it's almost like that little fat cell is in the way and it can't let that door swing open. So your muscles, your muscles and everything on the other side are going, what the heck are you thinking? Feed me. Oh my God, feed me. Give me some carbs. Hurry up. And then finally the insulin's able to take the sugar into the cell. When, when those fat, cells kind of get in the way and we don't know kind of which comes first. Does the fat cell get in the way or does the insulin receptor just kind of get sticky? In those kinds of settings, there's a couple of things that can be useful. One is, yes, having fewer carbs so that your body has to use up what you got. I will sometimes, excuse me, use metformin. I mean, metformin is a, a medication for diabetes. It's, it's an insulin receptor agonist. It makes the insulin receptor work better. And in some ways, I think of it as WD-40 for the insulin receptor. It makes that door swing more easily. If the door can swing more easily, the insulin can take that sugar, dump it where it needs to go. Your muscles and your cells are like, eh, good. I have, you know, I got enough there. 
good to go. And you kind of decrease that carb craving. So that's when people talk about being addicted to sugar, they're probably a little insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. um, oh, it's, and I'm sorry, I have to just look over here real quick. I see Philo, you mentioned a client who had four bags of baby carrots every day. Like again, moderation, but I actually wrote an article. About, <laughs> this woman came in to see me and she had this orange glow. Orange tint on the, we could get it on the palms of the hands. Yeah, I knew, I knew somebody that had that. She was just, she she really had this orange glow and I, luckily i had a medical student with me and you know we're going through all these different kinds of things could it be liver could it be this but we always include a 24-hour diet history and we asked her and sure enough she was pretty much eating a bag of carrots every day not a bad thing i mean seriously it it, it wasn't bad but the carotene was coming out and <laughs> to her skin mm -hmm. and and everybody was worried that she had some underlying liver disease but she didn't so you know four bags of baby carrots every day Okay, she's probably going to get a little orange, but it's if you're doing just that, what are you not doing? Mm -hmm. You know, and the goal with fruits and vegetables is five different colors a day: purple, reds, greens, oranges, yellows. When you do that, then you know that you're not getting stuck in kind of one. Right. We have know. a feature on our show called Travis tries it, and <laughs> what's the matter? With you? <laughs> and um, because you know he'll eat things when I sneak them in, and um. So this is just full on like, okay, we're going to try cauliflower rice. We're going to try cauliflower mashed potatoes. We're going to try roasted beets. But you have to and admit, I'm a good eater. You're a good eater. Like whatever you put in front of me, I, I eat it. Right. Without complaining. Right. And then we do what my, my uncle Art used to say. If, if he didn't care for something my aunt made, he said, don't be in a hurry to make this again, which is much better than, I hate this. Yeah. But <laughs> we, we bring on an assortment of vegetables for Travis to try. And... Uh, so what she's getting at is I do like vegetables and, and I will try other things. Mm -hmm. And we're very good. We're, we're even before we started the show cooking with Debbie and friends, we were very conscious of trying to spread out the red meats and bring fish into the diet. Not always just chicken, lots of salads. We've always loved those types of foods I, too. I have a question. Um, Teresa, do you ever, do you see like one, um ethnic group that might have a better diet than other ethnic groups well you know unfortunately these days obesity is rampant it's everywhere and so it, it isn't um but is that us is that an american diet though well you know, well unfortunately it's kind of the way it's been going around the world you know oh, really because we've been importing or exporting too many of our bad habits i guess but also i mean if you really think about the way nutrition has kind of gone the whole world with few exception has become one you know not cooking as much okay till until the pandemic maybe that's mm -hmm. been helpful but it's it's much more easy so it's easier to get high caloric foods i mean when we were kids deb how often did we go to mcdonald's like yeah. never but now you, i have families and they were small and, oh, yeah they were little yeah, I remember going for the Big Mac, and it was it, it. And my dad, it was Paycheck Friday, and he's like, "We're gonna go to McDonald's. We're gonna get this new Big Mac." And it was the biggest hamburger I had ever seen in my life. And now it's pretty commonplace that right. size. Right, right. So you know, so I think it, granted, I think the Mediterranean diet is, is a great one in right. general. The, the mm -hmm. true traditional Mediterranean diet. I think there are a lot of areas in the US that we can, we have really healthy foods. Um, we have to though get away from so much that's already kind of pre-processed because the more something's processed, the easier it is, the cheaper it is to kind of stick in without thinking about it. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you, let me put it this way, if you have to, if you open up a bag, it's probably not that great for you, you know? Because so you're selling those two for a dollar Jack in the Box tacos is probably <laughs> probably not the best. Probably not the best. <laughs> but they're so but it, delicious, Teresa. But they're is. so delicious. Deb, if you want one, then schedule your time that that is going to be your day that you are going to go and you know. Every now and again, I think we used to get donuts on a Sunday morning, and you know that would it was a donut Sunday. Yahoo! Yeah, yeah. And 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 we looked forward to it, and we ate them, and we enjoyed them, but they weren't every single day. Mm -hmm. you know? I love what you said earlier about, actually, you were saying we mindlessly eat, but I know what the point was, 
is to be mindful when you're eating and savor that that flavor and, and that food. Um, I think a lot of people, especially with the more um, availability of meditation and mindfulness, they're starting to think in terms of that in other areas of their life. So I love that you're talking about that with food because that really does help you slow down. And then when you slow down, that helps you feel full faster. Is that right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And then you really do think, do I really need this? And you can stop and go, am I hungry or not? You know? And if I just want another bite, then the longer it takes me to kind of savor it and enjoy it, the better off. Mm -hmm. And and I see a lot of other questions over here. Sorry, we're not going to be able to get to all of them, I guess, um, about uh, different types of vegetables that can cause troubles. We're not going to get into all of that. I guess I'm just going to leave you with it one thought of don't spend a lot of money getting a lot of testing done. Most of the testing that's, that is able to be done on minerals and vitamins and stuff like that are not always... Um, when they're, they're not always great tests because the levels um, change so much within your body. And most of the time those tests are being done by folks who, anyways. Got it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Um, and don't spend a whole lot of money on supplements. You know, their vitamin C, your body knows what vitamin C is. Doesn't matter whether it's from rose hips or from a you know, pharmaceutical company. I mean, it, and your body would love it much better if it was like in a big old orange that you ate. So, yeah. and mostly they're not regulated by the FDA, right? Oh no, none of them are. Oh, you know, no. It's, no, 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 no. Vitamins and supplements none. are not reg regulated. What? You will, you will see something called USP. Okay, USP is not an independent agency. It's USP approval is a. <laughs> The companies made it up themselves. <laughs> Somebody's Uncle Philip. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's like well, it's, it's the same thing as you know, if you walk down the cereal aisle, you see a big green check. Yeah, yeah, it says, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, no, the the cereal companies made up that big green check, and it and it means oh, there's a little bit more you know fiber in this. Yeah, well, it doesn't mean that there's less sugar. Yeah. So the so our rule has always been sugar has to be the third ingredient on the on the list, or you don't buy the box of cereal. And then I just didn't have to argue about it, you know? Mm. And the only two exceptions were Kix and Cheerios because Kix and Cheerios have grains and then they have a little sugar and then that's about it. So, but everything else we just didn't bother with. Interesting. Kid tested, mother approved. Proved. <laughs> somebody, <laughs> somebody wrote a cute little thing here. True story, the Big Mac was invented in Pittsburgh in 1967. Modern ambulances were invented in Pittsburgh in 1967, <laughs> the same year. Like we gotta get your heart attack ass to the hospital. That's right. Um, you are, um, before we came on, we asked if we could address COVID. Um, you are a doctor and your husband, what does he do again for a living? You told me. So Paul, um, Paul is a pathologist by training. He currently is the CEO of Covance. It's a, um, a contract research organization. They basically do all the testing for new pharmaceutical agents that are coming onto market, new vaccines and things like that. So they've been really involved with um, LabCorp and Covance. And so they've been really involved with helping to bring all the new vaccines to market. What is your um, advice to our listeners about keeping COVID free? And, oh, goodness. Uh, yeah. I mean, what, what's already been told is, you know, definitely mask up and stay away and distance and everything else. Don't hesitate to get the vaccine, okay? We're not mm -hmm. going to get back to normalcy until we have everybody vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And I know that folks worry about it's done so fast. Well, it was done quickly, truly. The science, though, was not rushed. What I was telling um, uh, Deb and Travis earlier is that, the federal government did do some good things. One of the things that they did is they took away the risk from the pharmaceutical companies to encourage them to be able to make the vaccine without delay. Because in the past, every time a new pharmaceutical thing would come out, every time a new drug or a new vaccine was gonna be coming out, the pharmaceutical company takes that risk. And so they have to make sure at each and every step that it's gonna be beneficial, that the market there's gonna be enough of a market for it, that you know, they're not going to, they're not going to fail, et cetera, et cetera. But what they did this time 
was the Fed said, we will take that, that monetary risk. You go ahead and go through stage one, two, three, and four without stopping at each stage and going back and, and reevaluating whether or not it's marketable. So it's so not this, a quality risk. It's a, a marketing mon uh, money risk. Right. Uh, because okay. while they were developing the vaccines, they were also producing them. So every time they learned something, they would go back so that you could get the FDA approval and have the vaccine ready to go. It's already built in. They would never have done that. You know, they would never have done that in a normal setting because you don't want to create something and then, you know, not know whether or not it's going to be able to be used or if the FDA is going to approve it or not. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if for example, um, the FDA says this certain vaccine doesn't work, sucks, we're not going to use it. The company is not on the hook for the amount of money it took to develop that vaccine. And that that's where the feds actually did some really good stuff with it because if they would never have put that together in the past. So it's not, the science itself was not rushed. The marketing and the development, the marketing was was rushed, not rushed. The marketing was like kind of went hand in hand. So, so yes, please get, get the vaccine. Everybody, whenever you possibly can, if you're not sure, you know, talk to your doctor about it, maybe even be in a clinical trial yourself. I mean, I'm in the AstraZeneca trial because I knew we needed more women and more, more people of color to be in the, in the trial. And so I volunteered. I don't know yet whether I got the placebo or the real thing, but I'm going to be part of the solution. So we mm -hmm. need you to be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. And I think herd immunity is would be great, but in order to really achieve herd immunity without a vaccination, we're going to have up to a million people die mm -hmm. in the country alone. That that's, you know, I I, I don't think that's worth it. Mm -hmm. My mother got the vaccine last week. I'm very proud of her. I'm grateful that she was eligible to get it, and that my siblings were able to find a way for her to get it. Thank you, Loretta, for getting my mother the vaccine. I mean, just think it gives you a little bit more freedom to be able to not worry every time you go out. You know? So then there's the question that Debbie asks. Um, Debbie once, Crow. You, once you get the vaccine, can you still be a carrier? Um, yes. And or can you transmit yes. it to others if you're exposed to it? Because, you know, it's airborne. It gets on you. We're all wiping down packages and food and everything. Even though you may have been vaccinated and cannot um, become infected or become sick, can you uh, expose other people? You still can Be because it's a respiratory virus, the re you know, and you breathe, you can have it in the lining of your nasal passages. Now it probably won't be a huge amount, true. Um, and even if you were to get sick from the virus, maybe your, your antibody immune response wasn't as great as it could have been. Because we know, I mean, how many of you had, we all had the hepatitis B vaccine when we were kids. There are many people who are still do not have hepatitis B immune um, antibodies. And it's just their body didn't respond to the vaccine as well as somebody else's did. Um, so, so somebody else asked a really interesting question about the second dose. So let me kind of like jump there for a quick sec. Sure. Thank Every you. Every vaccine, especially as when they're related to viruses, so think shingles, think flu, think hepatitis B, um, most viral vaccines make your body get ready. So, so it's almost like this. When you get the shot, you get something into your system that says, this is what that virus is going to look like. You go ahead and you make up some antibodies so that next time you see this thing, you're going to zap it. But by doing so, it kind of stimulates that ant, that immune response. And that immune response can feel muscle aches, fevers, um, chills. I mean, almost like, am I going to get a bad cold? And then it kind of goes away. So, yes, people can feel sick with the second shot, whether it's the shingles vaccine or the COVID vaccine. Okay, mm -hmm. no, I, Suck I, it up. Suck okay. it up. Because that is still a million times better than getting the disease. Absolutely. Okay. Now I, I stopped getting a flu shot for that very reason. See? Why do you I I'm keep sorry, telling you not to hit me in public? Save it for the bedroom, baby. Um, <laughs> so, so I stopped getting the flu shot 
because I felt really sick after. And, and I thought, this is not worth it. I, I mean, I literally would get the flu from it or I felt it. Maybe I'm just a big baby. But is that so that's kind of what you're talking about. That's my body figuring out how to build right. antibodies to fight it off later. Right. So okay. you're going to go get your flu shot. And you're not, you, you won't get the flu from the vaccine. You cannot get, there is no active virus in the flu shot. Now in the nasal spray that used to, that there used to be, but that's in the shot, you, there is no active virus in there. So you're not getting flu, but your body is rubbing up to fight it. Now it is true that women have a tendency to have a greater immune response to vaccines, especially to the flu vaccine. So we, we are looking at potential for for women and some women will give them just half the dose rather than the whole dose even though it's not totally you know legit and that might be something travis that you might ask for if you are somebody who really responds a lot to the flu vaccine and you know that and it's been happening year after year just ask them for half the dose and mm. see what you do for women mm. we're not sure if it's if it's you know how if it's real directly related to menses you know, like where they are in their cycle, because, you know, one year you get the flu shot and you feel fine. The next year you're like, you, it sucked. Um, and maybe it has more to do with that because we know that in certain, um, in certain times of the month, your blood vessels are a little bit more dilated because of the hormones and stuff. And so that may have something to do with it. We're, we're really not sure, but I certainly have at least offered that to my women patients who are really, yeah, that the last time that shot made me so sick, I don't want to do it. I'm like, just, just, just try half the dose. Are there any studies being done on uh, pregnant women getting the vaccine? Oh, yes. Um, there certainly are. Now, it, it isn't, let me just say, it's very, very common, no matter what the new drug is, no matter what the new thing is, we exclude pregnant women. It just, hmm. we, because it's two lives, not just one. And hmm. so it really isn't until most of the drugs have been shown or the vaccines, whatever, have been shown to be safe the normal population, but then they look at the next level and look at the kids, you know, look at, look at pregnancy. But in theory, pregnancy in and of itself should not be a big risk for any kind of a vaccine. Now, with, okay, I take that back. Any vaccine that's a live vaccine can be transmitted through the mom, through the, through the placenta and to the baby. So that's absolutely true. So mm -hmm. MMR, measles, mumps, rubella, um, and um, chicken pox vaccine, you don't want to take while you're pregnant because it does have some of the live, vaccine, live virus in it. So that's a completely different category. But those ones that are, do not have any live virus in them, like flu, um, tetanus, um, COVID, I'm trying to think, I'm sure there's a few other ones. I think hepatitis B as well, doesn't have any, any live stuff in it. So, so those ones, you might get a little bit of a fever or an immune response to it, but it's not gonna do anything to the kiddo. Okay. So, so our, my, our recommendation has been that yes, women should get the COVID vaccine. And in fact, I had that discussion with one of my patients just a, a month or so ago, that her risk for getting COVID was so too much greater. And we know that, you know, the day of the COVID when she was going to get a little bit more of a fever with the vaccine, she could take some Tylenol and then be fine. Very, very informative. And so you're, I, oh my gosh, yeah. I'm so impressed with you. Oh, I'm so impressed you. with your knowledge and your <laughs> demeanor and your ability to explain it to us. In, so how long have you two known each other? Since we were 14 and we're yes, 30 now. So First year, that's right, that's right. <laughs> Bishop Allot Lancers, baby. I there's so many Lancers on here. Did you see it? Good, yes. There's so that's many. Great. Aren't you guys so proud of um of Teresa? Huh? Jack, oh. Debbie. No, hey, we're Teresa. proud. We, we had a pretty good class, I gotta tell you. Okay, I don't know about all you other classes, but we were we were 78 was great. Okay, yeah. just saying a lot it. of doctors. Yeah. A lot of doctors. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And like good I said, stuff. I I tell dirty good jokes comedians. in Vegas. <laughs> yeah, but you know, Debbie, you were always smiling and you were always laughing. And you know what? At the end of the day, laughter is the best medicine. Aww. That's what, that's what makes us all better. And that's coming that's from right. a doctor. I know. Absolutely. You know, um, you're so informative and we really picked your brain on a lot of things. We were wondering if you would want to play because we 
like we say here on the show, we'll address the elephant in the room, but we won't let it sit on your chest and take your breath away. So we always like to end on something with some levity and some whimsy. So um, would you like to play, uh, Travis and I wrote a book about conversation starters because you know, your kids come home from school, what'd you do today? Nothing. Or I'd ask him, what'd you do at work today? Work stuff. So we came up with conversation starters so that it would be fun and, and you know, there's no pressure and just kind of fun um, topics. So would you be willing to play a, sure. a couple of questions? Okay. Sure. Um, my first one I love to ask everybody is, what is your most unusual um, purchase. purchase that you uh, made during COVID season? The pandemic. The pandemic. Oh, so, just during the pandemic. Something you didn't think that you'd ever buy in a million years, and there you are. I need one of these. Holy Moses. You know, I haven't bought a lot of stuff. We had somebody say jump rope because he's jumping rope because the gym yeah. closed. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, um, you know, I did buy one of those Bosu balls. You know, what's it? The, those Bosu balls are flat, and then they're like they're so that you can sit on them and do exercises and stuff. <laughs> you know, okay. Okay. <laughs> and if you could quarantine, we know you love your family, but if you can quarantine with anybody in the world, two people, two people who would be in your bubble, alive or dead. <laughs> And Anthony Fauci would definitely be in my bubble. Oh, oh my God, gosh, you guys would be so cute together. The conversations you two would have would be amazing. Well, you know, he went to my medical school. I'm just saying. Now he was, you know, he was, yeah, he went to Cornell um, in 19. I think he graduated in 1968, and I was in 1988. But um, you know, I just, I, I, he just is such a wealth of information. He's just so down to earth. I'd love to, you know chat with him and then oh my gosh the other person oh and now i am her name I, it's it's just blanking me because she was one of the first engineers in nasa and she wrote the code she just oh. died too long ago but she wrote the code as as the apollo was getting to the moon where neil armstrong was on it and as he was coming down to land we she had a listener that probably knows. okay yeah. richard Kahnemacher, that's for you so, she wrote the code. She wrote the code as she wrote the code as the Apollo was landing, and if she hadn't have redone it, it would have crash landed, and he would have died. And, and is and, she the one that's uh, there's a famous photo of her with glasses, of course, and she's standing next to the code, and the code is almost as tall oh, the, as she is. That could be. That could be. She wasn't know, from. I, was it the the movie Hidden Figures? Was she? No, no, no. She was not like this. She was white, but she um and I and she was at at. Uh, in San Diego for a long time afterwards. Is her name Margaret? Shoot. I'm gonna I'm yeah. gonna Isn't her, her name Margaret? I just used her the other day about something. And I mean those that I'd love to be able to sit and talk to those women. Those women who man, they had to do Margaret a, Hamilton. Could be. Could okay. be. Yeah. But those I mean, discussions would be great. Wouldn't they be fabulous? I mean they those, you know, when you talk about yeah, I was you know the first woman to do this or that man but those people they had to know their shit. i mean yeah. and they had to put up with so much yeah. every day i would just love to sit and say how did you do this especially yeah. that woman had to put up with a lot of shit. oh yeah, yeah. know it margaret hamilton from mit good be. yes okay. thank you for finding that look how smart she is i said stephen king because he could tell me how the pandemic would turn out because he wrote the stand <laughs> And Samin Nostrat, who wrote the book, um, Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat, a cookbook. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's so much better with her answers. Okay, would you rather, would you want, do you want to play a round of Would You Rather? Okay. Are we doing Would You Rather Am yeah. I? Yeah. We're doing that one? Yeah. Get okay. your bowl, babe. Get hang your on. bowl. I got to, hang on. I got to bring in the, I got to bring it in. <laughs> All right, we have the calendar of questions. If we get a dating question, we'll throw it out. I don't yes. know why there's so many dating questions and our people are married. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's too weird. Okay. Would you rather sneeze every time you say hi or have the urge to pee every time you ask a question? Okay. So, as a, as a 
postmenopausal woman, this is a really loaded question mm -hmm. because um, peeing when you sneeze <laughs> off, <laughs> always a fear. So I think I, I would pick the second where I would have the option of going to pee you know, purposely rather than sneezing and have to come on out without me wanting to. It just um, says, or have the urge to pee every time. It's not that you're going to pee. Uh, but still, okay. the urge is close enough. Yeah. The urge is close, is close enough. 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 Guy, guy, listen, when you're postmenopausal woman, yeah, the urge is close enough. You, yeah, mm, yeah. <laughs> Nobody ever told Oprah was the first one to ever tell us what would happen during menopause. Yeah. Um, mothers just never talked about it. No. It was just the change. <laughs> you had the friend at 14, and then the, yeah, it's off. It's the good old days of PMS. He's like <laughs> in bed with a, with a, you know, a blanket and, and a hat. And <laughs> freezing cold with the air conditioner on in the winter. Oh, jeez. Yeah. <laughs> How can we thank you for such a great interview? Hey, thanks for having me. It's been a lot of fun. And Loretta, hey, thanks for, you know, having me, encouraging this to come on. And and like I say, if you want to do something in the future about the whole COVID stuff and happy to bring the husband on and we can talk a little bit about the design and, and how things kind of came about and answer some questions about that. I, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of goofy things out there. Mm -hmm. And then there's a lot of just basic things that we all have to do to take care of each other. You know, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, love who you're with, enjoy mm -hmm. what you're doing, and listen to Deb when she does her, <laughs> does her comedy routines because laughing is really good for our heart and good for our soul. <laughs> I'll have to send you my set on uh, on a little uh, drive. They're naughty, though. It's a naughty set. <laughs> I think I recorded it in Vegas, so it That's is naughty. Great. That's great. Yeah, she, she drops the F bomb a few times. We'll get I drop it you. like a dinner napkin. <laughs> <laughs> well, we but, would love to have you on again. And with your husband, that would be lovely because yeah. you know we're we're looking uh, forward to the mask mandate, hundred day mask ma mandate, and the goal of a hundred thousand. Yes. No, hundred million vaccinations. Yes. Hundred million yes. vaccinations. Get yeah. in line. Don't hesitate. Get in line. Let's get the world back to normalcy again. Yes. Oh. Let's. Let's. All right. Oh, well, thank you so much. Sure. Um, we just loved having you. We would love to have your husband on when things settle down a little bit. We make this transition and we know a little bit more. We would love to have you on again. Hey, you were thank terrific. You. Thank okay. you. Thank All you. Right. Uh, thank you, Teresa. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Wow. She's so smart. Very, very intelligent. And let so me just smart. remind everyone, she was not offering medical advice. Nope. Please check with your own doctor mm -hmm. for your specific needs. But the, the content ranged, I mean, every, everything from diet to COVID vaccinations. Mm -hmm. I was she not kept, expecting that broad array right. of information. And she kept getting back to just like common sense, moderation, yeah. you know. Yeah. And I, but I didn't hear her say, stop giving me cheese. So please, could you just <laughs> lay uh, off the cheese? No laying off of the cheese, right? <laughs> um, but I do I do appreciate the, the information that she shared. Um, yeah, just a lot of common sense mm -hmm. and everything in moderation. It's so easy to talk eating. to. It's so easy to talk to. Because yeah. sometimes you go to your doctor and you're just like, uh you know, I, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to ask, but she was absolutely about being your own advocate with your doctor. Yeah. Who knew you could go to your doctor and say, can I try a half a dose? Yeah. Very yeah. true. A lot, a lot of people saying thank you. Yeah. And, and a lot uh, of Lancers happy. that came on. Hey Lancers. I don't always have a fellow Lancer I'm interviewing, but we do have some really good people coming up. So if this is your first show, please come back. We have some great comedians coming up on podcasts. We also have a very interesting podcast on February 16th with an, a planner for, she's an end of life planner. And those are some of the things that we forget about doing, like setting up our wills and what we want to have done. And our, you know, it, it's a difficult conversation. It's hard for me right now to even talk about it, but She's a, a really wonderful woman and she's got a great personality and we hope to take some of that stigma away. So that's February 16th. Mm -hmm. And the next couple of Tuesdays, we have some great comics coming Fun out. Stuff. And yeah. we definitely are going to have Dr. 
Teresa back in the future so we can talk more about healthy eating and foods that will keep you healthy. And um, I, I just, again, I'm, I'm just blown away at how easy it was to take that information in. So hopefully you feel the same way. Yeah, she was amazing. Yeah. So we are um, just wanted to remind you guys, we're streaming to Facebook and YouTube. Do us a favor, click that like button on there, click, click subscribe, head over to the YouTube channel. We are um, where we go here. We do, let me try to find my lower third there. Cookingwithdebbieandfriends.com is our website. On Instagram, it's at cookingwithdebbie. YouTube is youtube.com forward slash mommy comic. Please do us a favor, go over there and hit subscribe. Even if you primarily watch the show on Facebook, we really want to get those numbers up because what that will do is tell YouTube and Google mm -hmm. that this is good information, that you guys like what right. you're hearing. So they'll start feeding this into search results. Especially new listeners that came on just for Teresa. Did you see all the new listeners? Yeah. They came on just for Teresa. I think that was amazing and wonderful. Yeah. And, and a real tribute to what yeah, she's about. Sure. Yeah. So, um, and, and for those of you that may not know, we also do a live cooking show right here in the kitchen on Sundays at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Of course, the podcast here on Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. And that podcast goes to all of your podcast uh, platforms, Spotify, Apple, iHeart, Stitcher, Google, or wherever you're getting your your podcast. So please follow us so that we can um, keep delivering all of this content to you and the guests that take the time out to join us. Yes. Thank you so much. We'll see you. All right. Bye-bye.